This is Stuart Millard, and you are haunted. Our first letter comes from Georgie in Nottingham. In the 80s, I acquired an illegal police scanner. I wasn't a criminal, just a nosy parker. Some evenings, if there wasn't much on the telly, I'd stick the scanner on and listen to the chatter coming in. I lived in a pretty quiet area, so it wasn't exactly Grand Theft Auto out there. No shootings, no drug raids, and most of the time their radioing back and forth made for little more than interesting background noise. Not that there weren't occasional juicy calls, like hearing the address of your neighbour from two doors down, and watching out of the window as ten minutes later the cops pulled up to sort out a domestic. It made me feel a bit omnipotent in a funny way. Of a Friday night you'd hear them dealing with scuffles between drunks on the last train back from the clubs, and the weeks they spent one winter trying to catch the culprit in a spate of graffiti vandalism by someone calling themselves Mr Piss. It ended up being some school kid who got found out from always having yellow paint under his nails. Anyway, around 11 o'clock one night, an airless summer night, where I was laying on top of my bed with the window wide open. A call came in. Someone had rung the station and reported, a silver man walking along Camberley Road. Camberley Road ran beside a small stretch of woodland where people took their dogs, with an industrial estate on the other side. I'd heard them responding to obvious crank calls before bored teenagers reporting escaped lions in their mate's gardens, a bloke who said he was being eaten by a shark that had come out of the sink, who they found, on entering his property, had taken a lot of mushrooms before getting stuck inside the kitchen bin. So when the silver man call came in, you could hear from the weary, jovial tone over the radios that they knew it was someone either dicking about or who'd been at the cider. The officer closest to the scene was dispatched to check it out, this young constable who'd only been on the job about six months. His progress reports over the radio allowed me to hear the whole thing play out in real time. He arrived at the bottom of Camberley where there was nothing out of the ordinary, before proceeding up the road on foot. I remember so clearly, he said, All's quiet, nobody around, over but within a few seconds, added, No, hold on. I do see something. What he described was a person standing in the middle of the road, completely still. As he got closer, he noted the figure was a smooth, solid shape, and, I quote, a man and a half in size. When he shone a torch at it, the light reflected back in his eyes, causing him to look away, and when he turned back, the silver man was striding into the woods. Asking dispatch whether he should follow, the young PC was told to wait for backup, but almost immediately, he reported a glow coming from the trees and said he was going in to investigate. This is all pre-body cams, so all there is to go on is that transmission, and his live description of seeing a light in the distance and following it. The scanner was then interrupted by a call from the other side of town. A pensioner who'd gone to bed and swore it had suddenly become daylight outside, just for a moment. It was dark again when they'd gone out for a look, with a noxious smell in the garden, and should they bring the washing in? When I next heard him speak, the copper was noticeably agitated, breathing hard and disorientated. The light, he said, had moved. Once he got within range, it had suddenly gone out, and now appeared to be coming from the trees behind him. Panic was setting in, 
as dispatch told him backup was almost there and to make his way back to the road. Can you hurry? He said. Please hurry. I was absolutely riveted, sat bolt upright and staring at the scanner, to the sounds of him stumble running through the trees, almost crying in fear, while his colleagues told him to hold on just a few moments longer. Then there was a terrible shriek of, Oh God! Calls came ordering him to respond, but there was nothing. We're just approaching Camberley said a voice, with blaring sirens audible in the background. And then, he was back on the radio. I found the silver man. Another copper asked, Confirm, you have a visual? Yes, he said. He's standing right next to me. That was the last thing he said, at least the last thing which could accurately be described as language. There were a few seconds where nobody spoke, to the point I wondered if they'd switched frequencies, but then a scream. It was a scream like I'd never heard, filled with guttural fragments and half-formed letters, like a man vomiting out his mind. The noise seemed to fill my room, and I don't know if it actually shook things off the shelves, or if I'd knocked into them while bumbling around, hands clamped over my ears. As suddenly as it started, it was over. Silence. I stayed listening to the radio chatter when the rest of them finally arrived on the scene, and when they searched for the rookie constable and when they came upon a smoking, blackened spot on the ground, burned gristle and bone, a half-melted helmet, that's when they did change frequencies. I didn't get much sleep that night, but I do remember closing the window. That part of the woods got fenced off, and even now, decades on, there's a sign warning of private property and prosecution for trespassers. A few days later there was a story in the paper about a young policeman of the same name who'd been killed on duty. Car accident. Swerving to avoid a fox. I destroyed the scanner after that. Smashed it up with a hammer and fly-tipped it miles away. Started listening to the World Service instead. This story was sent in by Andrew C. in Pagham. I still remember getting the text that started all of this. It just said, your dad's got himself a boat, with a little kiss on the end. I think mum was hoping he'd name it after her but he called it The Lady Corrine, after some actress he fancied off Doctors. I suppose he figured if he ever bumped into her, that would be the perfect icebreaker. I don't think he'd even been on a boat before, but it was just a small one, and at least it got him out of the house. He spent his Sundays doing it up, and it seemed like it might awaken some small sense of adventure in a man who'd only used his passport once, to watch Portsmouth lose in a friendly and bring back some cheap ciggies for his workmates. He wasn't even into fishing, I just think he liked the idea of the freedom, something just for him, that whole man cave thing. He said of a neighbour, he's only got a shed, I've got the whole ocean, It certainly made Christmas easier, now that he finally had a hobby, and rather than three copies of the same Clarkson book he'd never bother reading, we all got him boat-related presents. I bought a CD of sea shanties, 
and my sister found this old-fashioned navigation compass while mum knitted him a chunky captain's jumper. He particularly loved that and was still wearing it come New Year. She said he hadn't taken it off once. Still, I think we all assumed he'd get bored with the boat, but he continued to take it out every Sunday, back in the evenings in time for call the midwife and feeling refreshed. Then he started going out on Saturdays too, and occasionally during the week. It got to the point I hardly saw him, and every time I went round, Mum would say, Captain Pugwash is off on the high seas again. She didn't really mind, no doubt glad of the peace, able to sit and do her Sudoku's in front of Midsummer Murders she'd seen a dozen times, without having to listen to him banging on about Corbin. Having kept missing him, I wandered down to the docks one afternoon on the off chance, only to find him tinkering about on the deck. He was a bit quiet, a bit off, and I sensed he had something on his mind. After about an hour of awkward, stilted conversation, he put down his tools and took a deep breath and said to me, Son, I've met someone. My stomach dropped, like all the bones went out of my legs. Had he been on dating sites? This is a man I've seen trying to print a YouTube video he'd enjoyed. That must be where he'd actually been all those weekends. With her. I felt so stupid and asked where they'd met. Out there, he said, just pointing out at the sea. What, like on the ship's radio? No, he said. A mermaid. As he told it, he was tootling along in the water and saw something keeping pace alongside. And at first he thought there was some seaweed caught on the hull, but then it broke the surface, revealing, in his words, the most beautiful face he'd ever seen. I knew that would break Mum's heart if she ever heard. Worried this woman was drowning, he cut the engine and tossed down a life ring but she calmly rolled over in the water, showing off the form of a classic mermaid. Bottom half a fish, top half a human lady. A very busty one, he specified. Said she wasn't covering herself up with shells like in the pictures, so you could get a good look at how massive they were. He felt an instant connection and said she spoke to him, only in his head rather than his ears. She refused his offer to come aboard, and instead invited him down into the sea to follow her. I wanted to go, he said, but I got scared. She smiled at him, a sad smile, before disappearing beneath the waves, never to be seen again. That's it, I thought. Old Sod's mind's finally gone. He described that moment as the greatest regret of his life, and he laid awake all night next to my sleeping mother, thinking about it, wishing he'd taken the leap. He'd been out first thing the next day to look for her, but as he put it, sea all looks the same. Hadn't stopped him though. That's when he started taking the boat out as often as he could, and after our chat, it only got worse. Day after day, all weathers, at first as soon as he got in from work, and then he stopped going to work altogether, and they let him go. By this point, with him telling her the whole sordid tale, Mum had had enough too, and kicked him out. I figured it would just be temporary, that this would snap him out of it and she'd end up taking him back. But he wasn't fussed, content with sleeping in the hull of the boat and scouring the coast for this bloody mermaid. I knew I had to confront Dad about it, but didn't want to drive him away completely, so I played along with his delusion, asking him how he expected it to work if he ever did find his undersea queen again. Was she capable of coming onto dry land? His new flat didn't even have a bath. 
or would he have to move under the water? How would that work? He said he'd be able to breathe just fine down there, and she wouldn't have asked if they didn't have a system in place. It's common sense, he said, unlike your mate Corbin's free broadband. That's when I lost it. Just snapped. Told him to stop being so stupid. Told him how they're just a myth. Old-timey sailors, drunk off rum and mad with the horn from being stuck at sea for months. They'd see a manatee rolling round and dive in to shag it in the blowhole. It was just folklore. Here be dragons and all of that. I mean, there probably aren't manatees in the English Channel, but he hadn't seen what he thought. That's when he went all quiet, confiding in me that he hadn't been completely honest. And in his words, that mermaid, son, she told me if I went with her, she'd suck me off. After that, I realised there was no talking him down and just left him to it. Left him to dream about going for a night on the town with his new young girlfriend, riding on the back of a big seahorse. Didn't hear hide nor hair from him, and periodically I'd walk past the docks, always finding the mooring empty. Month or so later, I was at Mum's, and there's a knock at the door black uniforms visible through the frosted glass, that checkerboard design on their hats, respectfully held at the waist. Someone had reported the Lady Kareen drifting, about ten miles offshore. Coast Guard had gone aboard and found it empty before towing it back. I mean, I knew what it meant, but part of me wanted to believe he'd discovered his happiness. It was easier picturing him living among the corals and the fish, going to bed in a clam and playing five aside with a giant pearl than, well, and who's to say he wasn't? Dad's body washed up about a week later, found by a day trip of deprived kids from London looking for winkles. He was still wearing the big jumper, but missing his trousers and pants. Cause of death was drowning, though he also had what the coroner would describe as a significant dismemberment injury. Very specific bite pattern. Consistent with a common grey seal. We sold the boat in the end. Mum used the money for a new conservatory. She can't bring herself to sit in it. This is from Anonymous. I was always a bit of a bad sleeper, tossing and turning all night, taking ages to get off. So a mate of mine suggested I get one of those apps on my phone. It's quite clever, tells you how many hours you're getting, what times you woke up, and of course, if you make a noise, it records you so you can listen to it back. Mostly when you play those, it's just blow-offs. I had one that went on for nearly 12 seconds made it my ringtone for a bit. Apart from the snoring, I found that, apparently, I sometimes talk in my sleep too. It's always just mumbled nonsense and you can't understand half of it. People's names or asking where the toilet is, stuff about pizza. One time I was seemingly very worried about getting fired for bringing the grumbleweeds into the office. But this particular morning, I woke up feeling really rested, checked the log and saw that I'd had almost nine hours. There was just a single audio file, logged at 20 to 4, three seconds long. Thinking nothing of it, I pressed play. I no longer have the file, 
but I wrote down exactly what I heard. He's sleeping like a baby. Now, even when my face is pushed into the pillow, dead to the world, I know what I sound like. I know my own voice. That was not my voice. I was almost too afraid to sleep the following night. Triple checking the door was locked, as it always was. All the windows, even though it's a second floor flat. Eventually I managed to nod off, and the next morning, soon as I get up, I check the app. Another file. 20 to 4 again. This time, almost a minute long. Took me a while to build up the courage to press play. Nothing's gonna wake him. Yeah, he's out like a light. A second voice. There was two of them. Whoever or whatever they were. So clear they must have been stood right over the bed. And they're talking to each other about me. Watching me sleep. They could have done anything. I was completely helpless. And then one of these voices, they say, Doesn't he look like that fella? James Corden. Obviously I was aghast. James Corden? Why is it, if you're a little bit on the bigger side of things, you always get compared to the only tubby bloke on telly? It's not like everyone with a beard gets, Cor, ain't you the spit of 16th century founder of Presbyterianism, John Knox? I don't look anything like him. Fair enough, I put a few pounds on since Covid started, but I do not look like James bloody Corden. My nose is much narrower, my hair is darker, I look more like... Colin Farrell. Yeah, not Corden. How many times have you heard a woman go, Well, you know who's really sexy? That absolute knobber who does carpool karaoke. Oh, come ravish me while shrieking at your own jokes. Fuck off. So I uninstalled the app. I'm not having that. Our final letter comes from Will in Stoke-on-Trent. This is about a guy I used to know called Smelly Goth. You know, like the song in Friends. His real name was Angus, but Smelly Goth's what everyone called him, behind his back. That or B.O. Huxtable, or B.O. Baracus, Sir Pong's a lot. Anyway, I was young at the time, 18, and he used to drink in my local. He was always going on about the occult, and would stand at the bar shuffling a pack of tarot cards while waiting to be served, trying to look enigmatic. He seemed harmless enough, if obviously a bit weird bit of a bullshitter. One time he said he'd blown out the candles on his birthday cake and wished for the death of the monarchy, and within the hour, Princess Di had been killed. Angus had long hair, and one of those leather trench coats that go down to the ankle, like in the Matrix. Those jackets were cool back then, before they got associated with school shooters and people who wank over cartoons. One Friday night, closing time, he invites a few of us back to his flat to continue the drinking. I only vaguely knew the others, but wasn't in any rush to get back to my parents, where I was still living at the time. His flat was... interesting, fusty smelling, like the windows had never been opened, and crammed with teetering piles of books and videos. There were posters on the wall of Swedish death metal bands in white face paint, and on top of the telly, a framed portrait of some bald fella. I asked if it was his granddad, and he said, That's Alastair Crowley, the greatest magician who ever lived. For now. One of the other lads from the pub made a joke about Paul Daniels. 
but Angus didn't laugh. He tosses each of us a can out of a carrier bag and disappears into another room, trench coat flapping like Batman's cape, and leaving everyone squashed on a tatty old sofa, silently sinking into the cushions. Soon he returns, brandishing these sheets of A4 he says he printed off a website at the library. This was the late 90s. He briefly held out the paper to let me look, but not touch. Some of it had been underlined in biro, and all I could make out was the header at the top, in a red, blood-drippy font. The Ritual of Summoning. This, he says, is what we're all going to try, because it needs four people, and the only other people he knows all hate each other and refuse to be in the same room. The rest of us are catching each other's eye, obviously thinking, this'll be a laugh, but he was deadly serious. I ask if we're going to summon the devil, and he tells me to grow up. This isn't a game, he snaps, and tells us, if we do exactly as he says, the ritual will grant him his every most desires. Angus pulls back a rug, exposing the floorboards underneath where a pentagram had already been scratched into the wood. Guy from the pub, this old rocker type with a grey quiff, he whispers to me, hope he's not going to make us bum each other. Worse than that, he picks up this beaker and gobs in it, then passes it round for everyone to gob in. Disgusting, actually, but we do it. Then he splashes it all over the pentagram and makes us sit on the floor, gives us these bits of string, we have to keep it taut, and it's going from one man to the other, sort of crisscrossing over a candle that's in the centre. He lights the candle and reads out this incantation. I can't remember it, but it was something like, I call you up from hell, into my service. Right as the string catches a light, and we drop it into the spit, he yells, I command you. Nothing happens. I think he was expecting something to rise up through the floor, or ring the doorbell, but his shoulders sink in disappointment. I slurp the last dregs from my can and figure it's time to leave, but then Angus suddenly gets this look on his face. Be quiet, he goes. So we do, and there is a sound, but it's hard to place. He tells us to find it, so we're all skulking around this flat tiptoeing from room to room, listening out for God knows what. I even looked in the cupboard under the sink. The old rocker, he's in the bathroom and says, I think it's coming from here. So now we're all stood in this tiny mouldy bathroom, crowded round the toilet, lid fully closed, and a gentle splashing sound coming from inside believe me, the last actual way I wanted to be spending a Friday night was poking around in smelly goss bog, but by now, I had to know. Gingerly, with the tip of his boot, as though there was a bomb inside, Angus lifts the lid. It's a frog, or toad, I don't know the difference but it was fat and green and looking up at us from the bowl of this disgusting skiddy toilet. He fishes it out with his bare hands and I can't tell if he's pleased or disappointed. I was hoping for a sexy succubus, he says, looking right into the frog's eyes. But you will do? I thought he'd want us to leave, but he no longer seemed to care whether we were there or not. He puts the frog in a Tupperware box and sinks into an armchair like he's home from a hard day's graft. And in that moment, I find something oddly regal about his posture. Like he sat on a throne rather than a chair. It was time to make a move, but just as I was headed out of the door, I looked at this frog and I thought, believe me, I've gone over this in my mind a million times over the years. And I had had a few, but I thought I heard it speak. Just one word. Tithe.
Never saw Angus in the pub after that. Believe it or not, his numbers came up in the lottery. First we hear of it is when he's in the local paper, holding up a big check. Still with that miserable look on his face, mind, trying to look cool. A few weeks later, he's in the paper again. Local man loses legs in railway accident. Just fell on the tracks at the station. He survived, but had to move from his nice new house into a bungalow. Have it converted. Christ knows how much it cost putting the ramp in. As usual, let's end on some short ones. Margaret Chocolatefinger tells us, I live near the beach, and though I haven't seen it myself, there's talk of a seagull around here, the size of a man. People keep going missing, and the council pay a bloke to sweep its massive footprints off the sand every morning. So I've heard. And from Roger in Anglesey, I did a body swap, but for real. You know those films in the 80s? One minute, I'm sat in my room. Next thing, I find myself in the body of Bruno Brooks. I had to present one of his radio shows, and then I got switched back into my own body. Couldn't have been gone more than an hour, but my penis was red raw. You Are Haunted was written, produced and performed by me, Stuart Millard. To support the show and get early access to episodes and a ton of other content, go to patreon.com slash franticplanet. Find me on Twitter at franticplanet and check out franticplanet.com for my other writing and videos. Credit for all music is in the show notes. Before you go, mate, who cut your hair? The bin men? Only joking, mate. It's a lovely haircut. <laughs>